This meeting of the Tyler ISD Board of Trustees was previously called to order. The presence of a quorum has been established and the meeting has been called, duly called, and the notice of the meeting has been posted in a time and manner required. We are reconvening from executive session and uh, the first thing we always do is the prayer and the pledge and Mr. Martinez has that tonight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here today and represent our community. May everything we do begin with your inspiration and continue with your guidance. We come to you today asking for wisdom and understanding. Please fill us with your grace as we make decisions that affect our students, teachers, and community. Lord, I ask that you help us to be models for our children and our students. May they continue to see us as loving and forgiving peaceful and just, compassionate and generous, and full of hope. May our time together unite us in our vision, strengthen our purpose, and be inspired by the dreams we have for our students and schools. And please allow our words and actions to reflect your message. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Martinez. Uh, we do have a little business to handle coming out of executive session. Um, we have the accepting the resignation of professional personnel and that would be the director of Head Start. I move we accept the resignation of Stacy Miles. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Seven no. Okay, we are going to move on to continuous improvement, section seven of our agenda. Uh, a being Goal one, star third grade reading results and state assessment of academic progress results. Mr. President and board, we have approaching the uh, table, Mr. Sanchez, our assistant superintendent of schools, Dr. Christy Hansen, assistant superintendent curriculum instruction. Um, as part of, the, of uh, your adopted board monitoring calendar, um, we put this uh, continuous improvement at the front of our board meetings in order to uh, publicly discuss our um, academic performance as we're moving forward to our, to our goals. Goal one is that 85% of our third graders will be reading on grade level here pretty quick. And um, we're here today to talk about the third grade reading results coming from this, uh, this year's State of Texas Accountability, the STAR, <laughs> whatever the acronym is now. But I'm here, here to provide that opportunity to the two assistant superintendents. We also have school improvement officers that are gonna be sitting beside, behind them as well. Sanchez, Dr. Hanson. So just a reminder very quickly, uh, what we're looking at are um, from the bottom to the top, the approaches, which is likely to succeed, and the meets, which is may need some short-term targeted academic intervention and needs little to no academic intervention. So those are the categories we're looking at here. So when we look at that goal one, um, we were, we were hoping that we were gonna have 77% of students that would meet the standard in third grade this year, and we did not meet that goal. We missed it by, uh, by 10 percentage points at 67%. So, um, not happy with those results. Oh, did I turn that off? There we go. Now, moving into the good news, that was the bad news. The good news is, is that um, 90% of the students that met the state standard in 2017-18 also met it again the next year. So we're not, kids are not losing ground uh, for the most part, so that's really good. And 78% of the students that exceeded the state standards um, also exceeded it the next year. And you can see those there and, and by subject. So there's, there's our elementary students, 94%. Um, met the standard uh, two years in a row and 84% exceeded the standard two years in a row. And there's where we are with our elementary. 
So as you can see, we had some real good gains in several areas. Uh, that third grade reading, we did not have the gains that we wanted, and uh, third grade math was flatlined. Uh, we would have hoped for more there as well. But we did get some bumps. We'll talk about the strong points and, and, um, and some areas that we know we still need to work on. I keep hitting that wrong button. So the biggest improvements we had in, in um, elementary was that fourth grade writing. We're very proud of those because every year we come before you and we're like, yeah, the writing, the writing. And so we finally did get some improvements in the writing, so we're very happy about that. It took a lot of work on a lot of people's part. And then the fourth grade reading scores, we, we got a really nice bump in as well. And as you can tell, uh, we, we had nine, nine out of 12 campuses that were higher than um, in the approaches category in 2017-18, and, and five out of 12 that were higher in meets, and eight out of 12 that were higher in masters. So we have some great things happening on the campuses related to the writing and then the reading as well, the fourth grade reading. <coughs> And then fifth grade overall, we, we had some big bumps. And these, this was cumulative compared to cumulative last year. So you can see that in fifth grade, we really had some nice big gains there as well in reading and math. And then the areas that we know we still need to work on, third grade overall um, and fourth grade math. So you want to talk about secondary? Before you go on, yes, sir. let's just remember, remind everyone that approaches, meets, and masters means that they passed the exam. And, yes, and they are on grade level. That's correct, and they're, and they're actually on grade level. And this is compared to college readiness right. as calibrated by your commissioner of education. Right. So I want to make sure that we're clear about that because I think sometimes when someone sees meets and masters, they think that's passing. Approaches is actually passing the test. It's, it's as it's calibrated toward college readiness. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Sanchez. Good evening, Board President, Mr. Washman, Reverend Mason, and Dr. Crawford, appreciate. As we look at our secondary level, we, we look to see that again in the secondary level, 86% and 72%, we had increases from the year before. So we appreciate uh, high school kids and our middle school kids understanding the importance of the exams. Um, as we look at the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, again, you know, sixth grade seems to be that interesting year, just like third grade is, because that's, you know, the test in the third and the sixth grade becomes more difficult. And I, we can't, I mean, we can, we can make excuses all day long, and we're not going to. The reality is we've got to figure out what to do between kindergarten and second grade so that kids are ready in the third grade for the first public um, look at what scores look like and how we measure up against everybody else in the state. And so sixth grade is an important year as well. And so the reality is we've got to figure out what we can do, you know, four to five, five to six in that summertime to, for that gap that we continue to see. And that's a difficult year. Kids are moving from elementary school to middle school. And that's just the reality because it happens between the eighth and ninth grade as well. So, but we are pleased in the areas that we've seen some growth. Um, but again, we, we are concerned with, you know, our seventh grade math, we're concerned in eighth grade math, you know, it, it kind of ebb and flows, if you will, on reading and math. And so as we think we're doing, doing well in one area, um, then, you know, the next year comes around and then we start to struggle. So that's an area that we're going to have to figure out how to be consistent across the board. Our biggest improvements were in the seventh grade writing and eighth grade social studies. Um, as we've kind of looking at the standards and helping kids read and write we see where we're having some pockets of success but certainly we're not happy with not all grades excelling and exceeding what our level of expectation is for them so the areas needing improvement as we mentioned is in the sixth grade again transitioning from fifth grade to fifth grade to sixth grade continues to be a struggle and so somewhere along the line we, we've got to figure out what can we do maybe at the latter part of the fifth grade and so that kids are maybe seeing some of the sixth grade uh, teaks or sixth grade information uh, maybe at the latter part of the fifth grade so those are just some of the things that you know we're continuing to look at um, to see how it is that we can get better and as we look at the eighth grade um, pretty stagnant there we are mindful that this data is reflective of kids who um, are on on level classes on level math if you will because our 
kids that are taking algebra, take the ninth, take the star ELC. So we are taking a portion out of, of our top performing kids off of this data. So we gotta be mindful of that. But nevertheless, we've still gotta figure out a way to ensure that our eighth grade kids that are on level are performing or exceeding our expectations of them. And then moving to the high school, um, again, we, you all saw this data before, but again, just reiterate, proud of our high schools uh, and the work that they're doing. You know, the teachers are doing and the principals doing, ensuring kids are successful. Um, notice that rise in early college, uh, because they don't have senior classes, um, some of their data is, uh, will be lagging data, but uh, it's gonna be report accordingly as you see it here. Questions for us? I don't have a question, I do have a comment. This is an age-old challenge that we've been dealing with even from back in the days when I was a principal. But there was one year, probably shouldn't tell it, but I'm going to tell it. I went to Dogan and checked out some textbooks. And I checked out sixth grade textbooks and gave them to the teachers, fifth grade teachers. And those were used in the classrooms uh, with the students so they could have an understanding of what the students needed to master before they went to sixth grade. So I, I agree with you, it is important that they see the TEKS. Uh, second grade needs to see third, you know, so on. So they can understand the challenges that those teachers are facing and they can better prepare the students. So even though we see some increases, I know we can do better. Absolutely. And you've talked to us about that vertical alignment and wanting to make sure that teachers are, are collaborating across the vertical so we certainly are making efforts in that realm as well to, to ensure that, they're, that those conversations are happening. So there was a point in time when elementary teachers did meet with the uh, middle school teachers. Are you still doing that? We're able to do that through our professional development sessions at times where they're able to collaborate across the grade levels and um, really be able to have conversations about what the sixth grade understanding needs to be. Um, some of the other things that we do is we'll have uh, the, the maybe a third or fourth grade teacher take that sixth or seventh grade released star tests so they can see how those questions are asked and the rigor so that they can be teaching to the rigor in, in, with the end in mind. It's the rigor. On the third grade reading scores, um, obviously moving in the wrong direction. Um, can you remind us of what is different this year in terms of the major strategies the district's pursuing that you feel would lead to different results next year? So one of the things, as you know, that we did um, three years ago when these kids were in first grade, uh, first grade is we we rolled out a new curriculum and uh, the curriculum had some really important components related to uh, foundational skills and um, that what we did do was really work with teachers on the training pieces and um, all of all of the great materials in the world do not do any good if our teachers are not trained mm -hmm. so what we're doing this year is really focusing on the teachers training related to foundational skills, the phonemic awareness, the phonics, the kinds of things that we know that pre-K, K, one, two have to have in order to do well um, in later years in, in third grade. And what we know is that kids who come in as great readers, they may be great readers in kindergarten and first grade, but they start falling off in third grade if they have not had those foundational skills. So um, even great readers don't do as well in third grade if they have not had a strong foundation in phonics and phonemic awareness. We started that in February mm -hmm. uh, this year with our phonics conference and gone through some letters training with our, with our principals uh, this summer already, including spelling and handwriting mm -hmm. and the importance of those uh, as, they, as they are as far as formulation of, your, uh, of a reader. So I think that is something that's gonna take a little bit of time. I will say this, I think we're starting to figure out more and more about this accountability system, because it is different. Uh, when you start looking at the, uh, the cohort years, and if you look at last year's 
uh, third graders and what they, they did this year as far as improving in the fourth grade, I think that's something we need to be cognizant of as that we really don't have any too much data other than some of the pre-K data mm -hmm. that we've had leading up and maybe some of the map data, right. uh, NWEA, NWEA data um, that can really gauge about whether or not we're, we're growing these, these third graders. So that was their baseline as compared to last year's third graders. So that's something that we're going to need to be cognizant of as we go forward to see if they're, you know, moving in the wrong direction. Yeah, apples to oranges from last year's kids who are now fourth graders to this year's third graders for the first time taking a star test and making sure that that's aligned as far as our prog our progress monitoring. And that's a big question I have about it with, with MAP and whether or not that's able to accurately forecast our kiddos as they're going towards taking that first uh, star test. And we kind of saw some flatlining in mm -hmm. this year's third grade yes. uh, leading up to this. But I do think that's something we need to be cognizant of and get better at and being able to predict and prognosticate how they're going to perform. Because so we're comparing them to, la comparing yes. them to last year's third last graders, year's third right? Grade. Yes, this is not and that's a out, that's right. a danger mm -hmm. uh, because I do think that that's a, that, that, that it, it, is not, it is not apples to apples. It's a different set of kids, a different cohort of kids. So it's good baseline data. We want to, we want to be better. We got to improve tier one instruction and that's what we're trying to do. How many schools, uh, how many elementary schools have after school programs for third graders? Um, well, it depends on what. It's called after school uh, enrichment. Oh, right. So almost all of the, I could, maybe you guys can answer that question better than I could probably. I think the campuses provide the, before school and after school tutorials. Also, Boys and Girls Clubs are on all of our campuses, except for one, I believe, which is Caldwell. Um, there's a couple of schools, Pete and Jones, um, in Austin, and Griffin, I think they share, the, they travel. So there is an opportunity for kids to go to tutoring after school. And I want to use the word opportunity, um, because at times, I think that's where we're going to need the help of the community parents to ensure that kids who are struggling are are seeking that the tutoring that's be, that's being made available to them is there any campus who requires students to attend not boys and girls club after school i'm speaking of a program where teachers are working with students on campus right so we do have some saturday programs we have an enrichment saturday program and then we also have a, a remedial saturday tut tutoring program so we take the best of the best teachers and we pair them up with kids that need them the most. Reverend Mason, whenever you say stuff from the dais, I think that that gives obviously the ultimate empowerment to our principals to do those things like you used to. Please let me empower you to have <laughs> after school enrichment programs for yeah. your students conducted by the teachers from three okay. to say 345 or whatever. When you say travel, what do you mean? They're when I mean, you said you said Jones, Pete, right? So they bus them over. They bus them from Jones to Pete. I think it's their three. Yeah. They don't do it on their own campus, yeah. right? For boys and girls, See, I'm they don't have your own campus. There's not enough yeah. that participate for them to have a full standalone boys and girls club. But between the two campuses, there's enough, so we bus them over to. So their campuses are not doing it themselves. They're just doing it no, through the boys and girls club. Right, so there's, there's two different ones. So there's the school tutorials that are happening before and after school okay. in the, on campus. In addition to that, there's a availability of boys and girls club okay. tutoring that happens as well. Okay. Yep. State comp ed money, we're getting more of that this year. So providing an after school bus is something that we're gonna take a look, uh, hard look at as far as being able to have some of those after school programs more of them are you able to require students to attend we can highly encourage highly encourage seriously <laughs> students who are in great need need to yes. attend well we i mean we can incentivize it um we can give them snacks we can give them prizes um unfortunately you cannot penalize a kid for academic reasons or purposes so if, for example, if a kid doesn't go to tutoring, 
you can't put them in, sus in school suspension the next day. Well, not as, you didn't hear me say penalize. I want to see enri <laughs> academic yeah. enrichment. It is not compulsory, no ma'am. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> the compulsory piece of that ends when the school buses have to run, and et cetera, and that's where, that's, that is a big challenge. Uh, parents uh, want to have their kiddos home. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly run some after, some late buses I in order Ms. to Bell provide I see Ms. Bell out that. there smiling. Uh, Griffin had enrichment, and it was required of those students that needed it, and they attended, and the parents cooperated. Duly noticed. I know times change. <laughs> we are, no, we are empowered. We are empowered. Okay. Let me go back to the question about what's different for this year. So we've said principal professional development through letters. Um, and we've got 100% coverage on principals for, or essentially 100% for elementary principals. Elementary mm -hmm. principals, 100% coverage on that. Dr. Hansen talked about the, the teacher PD that they're embarking upon with our curriculum instruction leadership teams, better known as SILTs. Right, so that actually starts tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow is the kickoff, if you guys wanna come see it. It's uh, at their, the campus instructional leadership team that includes the principal, many assistant principals, a lot of master teachers, but most importantly, um, at, at a minimum of one teacher per grade level who's going to be sort of the expert. Um, they're going to be going through a very intensive um, instructional foundational <coughs> program uh, that's, that kicks off tomorrow. It's a year-long program. Um, in addition to that, every pre-K through third grade teacher will be going through at least three professional development days with the University of Texas Houston, the, um, so the CLI group. So we have really invested a lot of time and resources in making sure that our teachers have the, the training that they feel, they've told us that they feel like they need to help teach reading to the young, to young students. Dr. Hansen, where are they meeting tomorrow? Rosats. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the SILTs will, re will begin training um, and not complete it throughout. Uh, essentially, it'll take a full year to complete. It'll take two, two years. years. So they're going to do modules one through four this year and then uh, five through eight next year. And then next year, we'll start a new group doing one through four. And, and then all the pre-K through three teachers get two or three days of PD this they summer? They get three, three of the sessions with uh, the CLI group, mm -hmm. okay. three focused, sessions. Focused on literacy. Literacy, effective phonics, literacy, effective instructional strategies, reading strategies in the classroom, phonics and phonemic awareness. There's three different ones, effective reading instruction in the classroom, phonics is one, phonemic awareness is another one. Okay, and then in terms of other curriculum changes, We've got a new core reading program. Right, so we have a new in. core reading program, McGraw-Hill. Um, we took McGraw-Hill because it does have a strong foundational. The teachers, of course, chose that. That wasn't something that was chosen by district staff. Uh, the teachers chose that. It has a strong uh, foundational component, which was really important to them. And um, so that is our core reading program. We've enhanced it. We've made some enhancements. We've written some pieces that are important related to um, look fors in the classroom, um, but we have taken that, that core reading component in its entirety. And then any changes in tier two instruction, the intervention that the kids will receive? Right, so we, again, with that core reading program, there's a very strong intervention program that um, supplements that, and we invested in that exact intervention program because they work so um, seamlessly side by side. And so every campus ha also has that intervention program. Um, in addition, part of the CLI training is how to scaffold for kids and um, ensure that we're, we're helping support our struggling readers. Uh, we're also doing quite a bit of work with our older kids related to um, our fourth, fifth, and on, and on up. Um, into middle school related to how to help teach some of the skills that maybe they missed without actually sort of doing too much of the, we, we're trying to help shore those skills up without them feeling like they went back to kindergarten, if that makes sense. Um, so we're helping the teachers with that. So those, those literacy components are part of all of the PD we do, that, that core how to teach kids how to read piece. 
Because what we know is, even though we sort of said in just last year, every teacher is a reading teacher, the truth is, is every teacher is not a reading teacher. Um, algebra teachers are algebra teachers. So we're really having to help them understand some of those literacy components and how to help kids who are not good readers. And operationally, Reverend Hager, every campus builds in during their day intervention times. It may look different from one campus to the other, but Rice may have ranger time. Griffin may do theirs completely differently, but they do have those opportunities for those tier two kids to be able to be pulled out and provided um, supplemental instruction um, outside of their tier one instruction. And what's the district guidance for the length of time for tier two? Is that 30 a day, 45 a day? What's the, or is there a minimum standard for how long they'll have that tier two intervention? I mean, effectively speaking, I mean, 30 is probably a minimum on that. So I think there's a variation there in how long they're doing. I think Rice runs their intervention time at 45 minutes, I believe, sometime. I'm not certain on that. Yeah. I'd ask the SIOs. So, so the, the standard is typically a minimum of 30 minutes for tier two, and it can happen either inside the classroom uh, during small group instruction, or it can happen outside the classroom. Tier three has to happen outside the regular reading block or the re regular reading time. So, um, so the, how the model at the schools may look different, um, but certainly we're, we're working to, I know the, the school side is, is, you know, they turn in those intervention plans to make sure that there's something that's solid. And then from the CNI side, we work really hard to provide the resources that, that they need to get that done. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further discussion or comments regarding this item? Okay, thank you. Moving on, we'll have uh, B, which is goal 3.1, CTE certifications. The state in its development of its accountability system um, is now including college and career military readiness um, opportunities and reporting this year, again, another successful year is Gary Brown, Executive Director of College, Career, and Military Readiness. Mr. Brown. Board President Washman, Dr. Crawford, and the board members, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share some information on our current technology education program and the certifications earned by our students uh, during this past year. Uh, the primary areas just want to touch on accountability and then, and then the goal itself and then where we are at, at the state level and then of course the, the local level and then maybe a look ahead to what we're going to be offering and doing in the coming year. The, and this is something that we've hopefully become more and more familiar with, the CCMR, the college career and military readiness components within domain one uh, that's part of the accountability system. I think we all would agree that it's, it's what's best for our students for success beyond high school. And of course, in some of these components that will be in, in future reports where students can attain the college readiness measures through AP exams, TSI criteria, earning dual credit courses in math and English, dual credit courses in any subject area which would include technical dual credit uh, and then the, in the career uh, ready components that have the industry based certifications that are recognized by the state uh, and at the federal level we specifically focus on the TEA list the approved list uh, that come that come out of Austin uh, earning a, a level one or two certif certificate which is something the students can do at a post-secondary le level but simultaneously while they're in high school similar to dual credit and then of course the military readiness component that we have in place this specific goal focuses on the, the industry-based certifications that students are able to earn. The actual goal itself uh, that was written in 2016 with a target starting in 2017, we're in the third year of that measurement uh, that wanted to see a 20% annual increase. And we've said this previously, this was a, because of the baseline data at that time, this number's low. Uh, and I have mentioned this previously, with the new programs of study and the new certifications uh, that are coming out, some of that through House Bill 3, but some of it just some of the new CTA, uh, CTE policy and guidelines. This is something we'll need to revisit this year to change the, the structure. So we, those are not targets that we actually are looking at at this point. We have been under previously um, a list of certifications from the state that included 73. And we've mentioned previously that some of the areas within our CTE programs of study were not even listed. And so with much input from the state, from business partners across the state over the past year, uh, the state has adopted, and this is final, the 211 eligible certifications that go into effect this coming year. 
So as students begin school next month, this will be the list that we'll be working from, no longer the 73, which covers all programs of study, which will be advantageous to our students and preparing them in all areas. If you look at the, at the list, and, and I always want to remind this when you're looking at data, there's lag data. So when we say that this current group of graduates that will be graduating tw in 2020, that they will not actually show up in the accountability reports based on what they attain and earn until the 2021 taper. Mm -hmm. So just, just know that there is lag data when we're looking at this. So actually the fall taper that will come out in a few months will be looking back at the 2018 graduates, not the ones that just graduated a couple of months ago. Uh, these are the actual numbers from this past year. And as we sit here in July, we have a time period where students still have the ability to attain these certifications, and we have some, as a matter of fact, we know of since this uh, report was put together a couple of weeks ago, that have, over the summer, have earned additional certifications. So the actual PEAMS number that will be submitted will be a little bit higher. Not a lot higher, but a little bit higher than these numbers. So off of that 73 list, the one we're currently under, we had 389 industry-based certifications uh, earned this past year which is an increase of uh, approximately six from the previous year, but that's a final number last year. So I think as this number goes up, we'll see that gap widen just a little bit over the summer. Uh, the Perkins certifications, which do include some on the A through F list with some additional certifications at the federal level, there were 448 Perkins certifications earned. And then when we say industry-based certifications that are local, we include everything. When students get their CPR certification, when they go through a first aid program, those are all included in this particular one, and that's why you see a, a fairly large number there. But it is inclusive of the other two numbers. They're all included in So, in So we're program. putting another 700 certifications on top of the state and the federal? Yes, in addition to. In addition to, and, and 1,200 and, over the state, what the state's requiring? Yes. And those are based on the local ones. Just so you know where those come from, our uh, CTE Executive Advisory Board uh, that share information where they'll be in the health sciences area. We want to make sure that we're offering local certifications that our local business partners and community members feel like are important to Tyler and to Smith County. So that's where a lot of these additional certifications come from. Uh, j just a list of a few. I, di I didn't want to list them all, and, and you certainly have that data. But the top certifications that our students earned this past year were NCCER uh, Core Level 1. And we had 119 students earn that. And uh, NCCER, and let me make sure, I want to make sure I get this right, because I, I misstated it the other day, National Center for Construction, Education, and Research. So this is construction management, and eventually it will move into our manufacturing pathway. ASE, um, American Automotive Service Excellence, 61 students. And some of these certifications are new from our diesel tech program. So we had some engine and, and brake uh, certifications that were earned, and that was done completely in-house. So I'm very proud of those students. Health sciences include the CMA, clinical medical assistance, CNA, C, uh, farm tech, CPCT, uh, clinical patient care technician. There were 57 of those earned, and I know there are some more of those that students will uh, earn over the summer. They're still working on those certifications. And then AWS Welding Level 1, American Welding Society, we had 57 students. And those are just the, those were the top ones, and of course, then you can break that down from there. Some of the outcomes, just to look at some broader numbers and where these certifications fit into our overall CT program, 78% of our high school students, and this is all students, participated in the CTE course. One of the things I would say about this number, it's not as high as we would like to see it. We would like to see all students for all four years be in a CTE program and continuing. Some of the drop off, and we're working on this, occurs in the senior year. I'm going to be very honest. I think I've mentioned that before, where students will be in the freshman, the sophomore, and the junior year. They get their core requirements in place, they get their electives in place, and they just simply choose to do other things than take this four CTE class. So, this is going to be, I will tell you, it's going to be one of our major goals this coming year is to focus on our seniors to stay in that career pathway because it's a great opportunity to continue to earn certifications and to prepare for any career whether it's a four-year degree required, six-year or beyond, there's a course that they can take that will benefit them beyond. So we want to make sure we, we focus We started on that. working on the back end of Gary's principalship, high school principalship, of uh, some administrative regulations on um, yeah. when, when you could actually have gaps in your schedule. Yes. Uh, because there was a lot of seniors, I'm sure Mr. Washburn was one of them, that front-loaded all of their time. Um, 
I'm just saying, back in the day, I, I, I did it too. You front-loaded your time, and then you didn't have anything left in the back of the day. Well, that doesn't really benefit the kid. We only get, we only get them for one shot. And, and certainly in saying that, that's not what we're here for is to run half-day school. So I think being able to do that, and then our counselors and teachers have done a great job of conveying how important it, how important it is to finish through with your, your pathway has been a change of culture here. So it's taken us 15 or 20 years to figure that out, but it's really starting to work now. It's, that's where you're starting to see that 78%. And I, and I do think that number will continue to increase. I think students are seeing the value of ma and maintaining themselves. And plus the, the advanced levels are of course at the fourth year. So you're gonna get the great, greatest benefit if you stay in the program all the way through to, to completion. 26% of the students that were enrolled in the CTE course, and this is very heavily towards the junior and senior year, take an actual certification test. That's where you see the numbers generated from. And then of the students that did take a certification test, 90% of those students were able to earn the certification. So I would say kudos to our instructors for aligning the instruction, preparing the students for success when they do sit for the exams. Some of them are skills-based where they have to demonstrate skill. Others are, are, are just test-based, knowledge-based. So it's a combination of the two. These are new courses I just wanted to mention that we had this past year. So they're brand new starting in August of 2018. So we just finished up with our, our, our first year of emergency medical technician program, which was very successful and saw several students attain uh, certifications and complete those dual credit courses. Diesel mechanics I previously mentioned. We had firefighting, a very small group of students to start this. Uh, this, this next year, we actually are going to be moving that into the realm of dual credit. So students will, it'll take two years now, now that we've got the first year behind us, but they actual, actually will be able to move through the modules to get the state certification by the time they graduate. So that's kind of the next step in firefighting. New for 2019-2020, automotive technology. We already have students at the advanced level that are going to TJC for auto mechanics for the advanced, for the cert certificates and the AAS degree. And I, as I mentioned, the diesel mechanics locally through our transportation department. These are actually introductory courses. So we're moving this all the way down to the freshman level. So students that are interested in auto collision repair, auto mechanics, we know that there are, are there's a need, there's a demand, and there's high wages in these areas. And this is, this is local. So students, and, and we had a great response. We actually have a full load of classes. Our instructor is gonna be split between John Tyler and Robert E. Lee, so we had a good, full healthy sec group of students that wanted to take these introductory courses. We will see the benefits for those students as they move forward in year two and three as we start it. And then the other new one uh, that we've began once again, we, this is input from the community, from our local businesses, manufacturing with the resurgence of manufacturing jobs coming back not only to, 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 the, to the nation but to Texas specifically and then Northeast Texas even more specifically than that. We've added this and had a very good response back from the students. So these will be freshmen and sophomore students entering this program of study, and we'll see the benefits in years two and three from this. And along the lines, I'll just mention it because this is something that will actually have to come back to you probably in a, a couple of months. But we are we were involved with several local school districts, and I appreciate Dr. Crawford and the board allowing us to collaborate and work together in this manner. Uh, but in writing a Perkins Reserve grant specifically for manufacturing, so these school districts that are listed, I won't read them all, uh, TJC, UT Tyler, a lot of work with the Chamber of Commerce and, and East Texas Council of Governments. But we, we put this together, and so we were one of 10 regional sites that were awarded the grant to be able to move forward with this particular program of study. So that's a pretty good sized grant that we're gonna be able to implement some equipment and teacher training with to start the program. And I just wanted to mention that. So there's gonna be some additional information coming out in the future about that. And that pretty much, um, along with some other things, I just would mention this just as a, as a follow-up to the legislative session. There, there are gonna be some new things that are coming out of House Bill 3 specific to CTE, things like middle school funding, weighted funding, and what can be done in terms of CTE at the middle school level. Uh, the programs of study will be finalized next month. Public input closed last Friday. So we're gonna see those final programs of study. We don't anticipate any major changes. We feel like we'll be very well aligned in the district, but that will be information that will be needed, needed to be shared at some point in the near future. One question from me. Yes. You kind of went through this a little quickly. 26% students enrolled in CTA, CTE take a certification test. Why is that number so low? Well, it, it goes back to the, okay, so you have the, the original group of students is 78%. The certifications are, are heavy in the junior and senior year. So when we, when we say that 26%, the freshmen do not take certification tests. So you've got an entire group, if you've got a thousand freshmen, 
they're not taking certification tests. So if you're wondering why, why do 26%, basically one out of every four, because it's predominantly at the junior and senior level. The other reason why that number is not higher is because we were, we were confined to that small list of 73 certifications that's now been expanded to 211. We had some programs in the city that had zero certifications on the list. A student could spend four years in the program and have nothing that could be on the list to be taken. So I see, I would think those are the two major reasons. All right. You mentioned a drop off at the third and fourth year level. Um, have you heard of dissatisfaction actually on the opposite end, the entry level classes as being boring, not having much rigor? Um, is that something that is heard outside of my house? Um, or is that uh, something that you've heard and are trying to address? I think that, they, absolutely. That, that is one of the things that we're trying to focus on, it's just similar to the core academics, because this all fits together, is we want to see vertical alignment. So we want to see students all the way down in the middle school cla uh, classes in the college and career class being prepared for a rigorous experience the freshman year. So yes, it is something that we're trying to address, because that could be one of the reasons that's symptomatic of what's happening at the advanced level. So it's not continuing in that pathway. Okay. The capstone experience, obviously, with a lot of the trades or a lot of the certifications is at CT Center. Um, with the high schools that are being built right now and the, the career technology education classrooms that, are, that have been designed and the materials and the, uh, the learning technology is going to be inside of those, I think it's going to be pretty impressive and it's going to help with those um, those classes. I mean, right now, if you think about it, we're living in and operating out of high schools that were designed when, when ag was your biggest CTE program that you had and you had very little industrial technology and business level courses, architectural design, um, EMT, firefighting. I think we're going to be able to do some of those things uh, with our fab labs um, along with other CTE classrooms that are actually going to be at the high schools for those freshmen and sophomores. I agree very much. The, the, the new CTE wings at both of the remodeled high schools are phenomenal. That's yeah. going to add. Another thing that's been tremendous and we're going to continue to see benefits is the District of Innovation that's allowed us to go out and get some industry experts to bring in. So we're, we're in, the, this is going to be the third cycle, is that, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Third cycle of DOI hires and we've actually got a couple. An example is going to be our automotive technology instructor, has 20 years in, in, in the industry. Is going to be able to come in and impart that directly to the students right off the bat and those are freshman level courses that we'll be able to see a benefit from any other comments but i also must ask you a question yes. uh, of the new courses which ones do you think will be the most utilized there of just the two brand new ones that start in august mm -hmm. just comparing between auto okay. we have a fairly equal number between the two uh, we felt like that the auto mechanics would be, when we, when we put the course request out, we would get a good response back. I did not anticipate the numbers in the in industrial maintenance and manufacturing pathway initially. Mm -hmm. We thought we might have to sell that for a year. But the jobs that are there, it doesn't take much when you can talk about high wage, high demand jobs that a student, literally, our freshmen coming in next year, four years from now, four short years from now, can go out into our workforce locally and make a very good wage in this field. And I think that's, that's sold to a lot of students. Well, when I see the amount of certifications, I just see more opportunity for students for future stability, you know, future growth in education. So th these are good things, and thank you. Absolutely. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, section 7 of our agenda is 30 minutes of public participation. Uh, looks like we have three speakers signed up tonight. First of which would be Christina Folsom. Good evening and thank you. Good evening. Uh, we are absolutely grateful that Head Start has been reinstated. Thank you. Um, still worried that the issues that caused the closure uh, last month still exist, and that uh, there's a misunderstanding perhaps in the responsibilities of the school district board and superintendent when it comes to the Head Start program. Um, 
During last month's presentation, uh, Dr. Crawford shared the reasons for replacing the program, and one of those reasons was the results of the pilot program. And in the pilot program, they said there were four full-day pre-K classes at Andy Woods, two qualifying and two tuition, and that the data has come back with high success rates when compared to the half-day pre-K students and Head Start students when moving on to kindergarten. So half the students were not in the same socioeconomic group, not apples to apples, they were tuition based. And I couldn't find any performance reports for either Head Start or for pre-K programs, but I was able to find online the application packet for TISD full day pre-K tuition program. And what I found was that many of the students enrolled were TISD staff member students. Again, not an apples to apples comparison when you have a parent with high educational attainment and a parent that might not. Um, and then I found also on the packet something that I found alarming, which is on page 15 of the packet. TISD reserves the following rights. To immediately suspend or dismiss any child from the PK program, that the faculty or administration of the PK program or Tyler ISD may determine needs educa additional educational or special education services that cannot be provided by the PK program. Also, section eight on the same page, the parent acknowledges that the PK program is not a special education program under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, and that any pre-kindergarten student who is eligible for special education services under the IDEA may be served through other placements in early childhood programs. So none of the children in the program had a disability. Head Start, on the other hand, standard 1302 states a program must ensure that at least 10% of its total funded enrollment is filled by children eligible for services under IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So for these reasons, to say that the full day pre-K program had greater success rates than Head Start is really not comparing apples to apples. On another slide, Dr. Crawford reported that Texas and Tyler ISD curriculum and standards exceed Head Start curriculum and standards. According to Tyler ISD pre-kindergarten parent handbook, they used the curriculum that was called DLM Early Childhood. Head Start used the Frog Street pre-K program. And I was able to compare those two by using uh, the Early Childhood Learning and Knowledge Center website, side by side, looking at 14 criteria. DLM, the TISD curriculum, rated better on two, the same on seven, and worse on five criteria. So the TISD curriculum did not, in fact, exceed the Head Start curriculum. On the same slide, it says that the district-wide pre-K will provide opportunity for ownership and supervision of the academic development as aligned to Texas and district standards. According to the Head Start Act, the Board of Trustees of the school district is the governing board of Head Start, and the superintendent is the executive director of Head Start. According to the Head Start Act, the governing body shall have legal and fiscal responsibility for the Head Start agency. So the district has always had ownership and supervision of the academic program, and they could have aligned it at any time. Also, according to the Head Start Act, the Head Start agency shall have a policy council that is responsible for Head Start program, including program design and operations, long and short-term goals, taking into account community-wide strategic plans, needs assessments, and self-assessments. The Policy Council is made up of parents in the Head Start program, and is a form of advisory council for your governing board. According to Mr. Daniel Sells, the Policy Council was not engaged in any decision-making prior to the closing of the program. After hearing all of this and hearing the outcry from the community, any future discussion about Head Start, I hope, would be more transparent and include the Policy Council and the community to arrive at solutions. Yes, I am grateful and cautiously optimistic. I just want to make sure that the board understands that it is and it always has been your responsibility to nurture the Head Start program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we got Daniel Sells the third next.
Good evening, everybody. Good evening. As mentioned in the ending of her statement, I am Daniel Sells. I'm a former member of the Policy Council, also a parent of two children who went through the Head Start program. I come for you today having concerns as most of my friends who are uh, parents who have been accepted into the Policy Council with their worries of where to go from forward with this particular program. A couple weeks ago, the program was eliminated not known to the policy council that there was ever going to be a, a possibility that the program wouldn't be there, especially after the funds had been approved for the ensuing year. And also, we, uh, when that happened, it, it caused a panic amongst those families who had just got their children accepted and were going through the procedures on getting their medical, dental visits, and all their appropriate paperwork taken care of. Fast forward a couple weeks, it comes back. But there was never any clear uh, transparency on how is this program going to be implemented, are the classes going to be fully integrated, or are they going to be back to the Head Start only separate classrooms as it previously was done in years prior, even more so with the lack of uh, caseworkers since the, those, my, those, a lot of the people, who, including some of my friends who were caseworkers, lost their job that, that day when the, pro when the program was ended, all haven't gotten their jobs back. and they're, seem to be shorthanded after speaking to somebody at Head Start today. And also, there's no um, director of Head Start, so we don't know the status of the policy council. Usually there's meetings at least once every month to go over things that may come up, and then at the orientations that come, that, that, that start right before school when they have their placing, that's usually when the policy council elects the new council for that ensuing year don't have any update, don't have any standard standing on what that is, and now a whole bunch more families are more concerned with how are things gonna continue. There's no correspondence, no communication that's been sent out, and then when I talked to a representative at Head Start today, she says, well, we might be able to get paperwork out Friday. Well, when are we gonna find out when the placing may happen? Well, it may take a couple more weeks. There's about four weeks left until school starts. That's not, that's not right. You're causing an unnecessary panic. It didn't seem like it was a problem, speaking personally, when the program was eliminated and then all the wraparound services that were promoted were, you know, were promoted with such vigor, but now that the program is back, the same amount of energy to go ahead and make sure that the families that are approved are kept in the loop fully about what's going on. It's a, Head Start was a, is a very, very key part in my, in my life and my children's experience. I'm very, very passionate about education when it comes to my family and the education of those and my, and the low income and, and for those for children, period. And when there's an opportunity to have the resources for them to grow and to thrive, which Head Start has, uh, contrary to um, popular belief and what some data that's been unspecified as said, Head Start children thrive. If there's ever been a problem with Head Start in the, in the meetings that I've attended, not once did TISD ever come to specify any areas of improvement where things need to be addressed or, or worked on, and neither in the past year when my wife took my seat when she was at the meetings, nor has anybody in TISD ever been to a policy council meeting to see how, how it works and what, and what goes on. So, Transparency is what's needed. Families want to know what's going on so that way one, their children can be ready for when, time, when it comes for school and they can make sure that they're ready to make sure that they're transitioned from, from either, you know, going from daycare to Head Start is seamless. You know, it's children. Children don't come with instructions and, and, it's, a, and it's a learning process for all of us, but when, you get the pro when it gets gutted first without explanation, without any, any discernment or caring for what the people needed or we weren't even consulted or the policy council wasn't even talked to, talk to beforehand, it kind of puts a bad taste in people's mouth. And then when it's thrown back out there with no reassurance of any safety, safety protocol or anything there, it, it doesn't put much trust in you. So you have to understand where I'm coming from. And if you don't, I, I, I do apologize, but the, the people in the policy council and the families that it affect truly, truly need 
your your utmost attention and your and your and your efforts in this endeavor. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, and the final speaker tonight is Bob Brewer. Thank you, board, and thank you for the Bible and Education Conference scheduled for August 12th and 13th at Green Acres Baptist Church, three weeks from today. When I started a journey for the reclamation of Bible study in public schools, I prayed to commit the remainder of my earthly life to restore our founder's intent to have the Judeo-Christian Bible at the core of America's education. Little did I know what the Lord had in store for this mission. First, when I assumed that the Bible was not in public schools, I found out that it had been available since 2007 as a half-credit high school elective in all schools in Texas. Second, when my attention focused on the Bible and more grades in school, I found that Senator Brian Hughes introduced Senate Bill 2090 this past session that was to incorporate Bible literature in every ELAR class, uh, English language arts reading in Texas. Third, when I learned that Pastor Gene Ramsey of Flint Baptist Church was bringing America's uh, founding historian, David Barton, to Flint, I tuned in and heard uh, Mr. Barton quote early congressional logs, logs that uh, contain, uh, from the Congress that contained signers of the declaration that said, resolved that the United States and Congress assembled recommend this edition of the Bible for the inhabitants of the United States. This Bible is an addition to the Holy Scripture for the use in schools. After the signing of the Treaty of Paris, one of the first things that Congress did was to commission the printing of 10,000 copies of the Aiken Bible, now one of the most valuable Bibles on earth. Fourth, and almost coincident with uh, seeing uh, David Barton, I saw our trustee and Bethel Bible pastor on KYTX Channel 19 discussing how to make Tyler S. ISD more faith friendly so that people understand where the lines are for the appropriate expression of faith, all faiths. So, fifth, I was additionally made aware of other appro uh, appropriate expressions of our faith from 400 years ago. Uh, we're right on the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower Compact, Compact. and before those. Uh, people ever set foot on the shores of the New World, they created and signed the Mayflower Compact. This document expressed the principles, principles of liberty that later established our Judeo-Christian government of the United States of America. Number six, more lines for the appropriate expression of, expression of faith surround our Supreme Court chambers with Moses there, front and center, and the Ten Commandments. These lines for expression of faith are also in our House and Senate, where each has a paid chaplain to provide prayers every morning. And also the practice of every elected body, including this one, that prays before you commence your scheduled proceedings. Seventh, the lines for the appropriate expression of faith were drawn by our Declaration of Independence with the words, Laws of Nature and nature's God. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Eighth, these lines for appropriate expression of faith continued in our Constitution with 56 signers. 54 of them were Protestants, one was a Catholic, and one was a Jew. You yourselves have sworn oath to protect and defend this Constitution, and I dare say, and I'm sorry to say, there's not one person in America that is abiding their oath of office. As evidence, I present the, the first sentence of the preamble and the second clause of Article 4, Section 4, the Constitution's Guarantee Clause. These words express the Constitution's reason for being, providing for the common defense, and shall protect each of them against invasion. That purpose and guarantee is being ignored by every elected representative in Washington, D.C., Austin, and even in Tyler. Until we teach, until we know and teach, till we teach and know the Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, and the foundation on which they are based, we will never know the lines for the appropriate expression of faith that are as clear 
as those drawn in the soil at the Alamo or even more clearly drawn a century before with the words of Christians who signed our declaration with their signatures and the words with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Okay, that's it for public participation. Moving on to business legal finance consent agenda. Item A is uh, approval of the amended budget. Do I have a motion to approve the amended budget? Any, any comments on that before we do so? I'm sorry, did we pull A or are we looking at A through D? I'm looking at A through D. Okay. Do we want to go ahead and do A through D? If there's no discussion, I'll move that we approve A through D. There you go. Second. All right, all in favor of approving A through D? Aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Ayes have it, 7 up. Thank you, Fritz. Okay, have we, have we pulled anything on the curriculum instruction consent agenda, or does anybody want to pull anything before we move on to that? It's pretty long. We've got um, a MOU agreements with places like Fort Hayes State University, University of Texas at Tyler, Jarvis Christian College, Texas College, um, for uh, uh, student teacher um, opportunities uh, within our school system. We also have um, expenditures for, um, for learning curricula for all of our students, um, encouraging our staff to put together their, their needs um, ahead of time as opposed to during the school year for y'all to act on at one time so that we are prepared for the first of school. Um, that also includes your NWEA, the Northwest Evaluation Association Measures of Academic Pro Progress, our annual renewal, along with um, our agreement with Blackboard where we house a lot of our curriculum and professional development um, online solutions along with our website and a Tyler ISD app. So that's kind of a little debriefing there about the different um, opportunities and for y'all to act upon in this in case you want to pull something. If not, that's a briefing of the... Thank you for the briefing. Consent agenda. I have one question. Mm -hmm. Where's Fort Hayes? Fort Hayes State's yeah. in Kansas. Fort Hayes what? Fort Hayes. Kansas. It's okay. Yes, ma'am. We're done. <laughs> I have one question. Um, several of these items were for literacy programs or elements of our reading plan. And since we're falling short of our goal significantly, I'm wondering if part of uh, the phrase tradition will get you beat echoes in my mind even when I'm not here at TISD. And when I see us using some of the same programs repeatedly and us not getting the results that we are looking for, I just want to hear that we're scrubbing these programs to figure out whether or not they're getting us what we need to get and, or they're, free, they're being canceled and freeing up funds to do something else that we think will have better results. Well, I think the way to look at this is compared to what we were buying in the past, um, we've eliminated, eliminated a lot of those okay. um, and provided opportunity to keep some of the ones we think have been um, sustaining where we're at. So, um, again, I think you got to have some of these online solutions and support, but our focus has been recently to improve Tier 1 instruction by providing the, the training to the actual teachers on that. So, a lot of these opportunities are also with uh, uh, some of our Tier 2 interventions as well. Um, some online solutions as far as what's, what goes home with the kids. So if I'm wrong about that, then state that. But the ones that we have chosen have kept have been scrutinized over the, over the years, and we've actually eliminated a lot of the, the software and the, and the tools that we've been using over the years. And we're keeping these because these actually have been proven to be effective enough to, to, to remain here. Right. So we – wow, that's odd. We, we did – um, eliminate several of the online solutions that we've used in the past. We narrowed it down to just a few. And, um, and then the principals came in um, with staff if they chose, and there were certain criteria that we were looking at. Some, some had to do with how well was it aligned with what our, you know, what our objectives are related to foundational skills. 
Um, and then also we, we became very specific about what the solution is being used for. Some of them are really being used for skill practice, others for intervention, others for tier two. It just, it, so we're real specific about that. Okay. Um, and then we have a monitoring plan set up between the school side and the curriculum side to really look at the usage and um, help monitor that so that the supervisors are talking to the principals about what's being used with fidelity and um, if not, what are the obstacles to that? Can we, can we overcome some of those? Okay, thank you. Move to approve curriculum instruction consent agenda. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. Ayes have it, 7-0. On to our discussion section of the agenda. So A and B, you have quarterly financials um, that, are, that are mandated to be provided to the board um, in regard to uh, in a compliance with state law. If you have any questions in regard to that, you're more than welcome to contact Tasha B. York um, in the finance office for the financial executive summary or the investment report, and you can ask your questions now as well. Okay, any questions or comments for Tasha? Okay, Tasha, talk a little bit about the investment report, which, what your feelings are in regard to that. Changed that policy a couple of years ago to give us some more flexibility um, out, outside of what was mandated by the Texas Association of School Boards policy right now we're earning about two and three point three four percent interest which is really good that's our average and that's really helping us out a lot our budget has increased in interest income and that will help us next year in our budget too so what we were we, what were we getting say five years ago before we actually changed some of our policies well probably less than a percent yeah and compared to the economy, I mean, that, that's got something to do with it as well. Right, the economy has helped a lot. Okay. Tasha, could you comment just on our insurance fund? It looked like it was trending in a direction that we, wasn't great. You know, we have a maximum that we have to spend. And at the end of this month, I expect we'll hit that. And then the Christus will start ringing well, they won't start then reimbursing us, but we will get reimbursed anything we go over that maximum that we pay to them. So we still have August and September to go after July, and those two whole months will probably have to be reimbursed. We've hit that guaranteed maximum. So um, their rates, or higher than what we were paying before, but they guaranteed a high level, or a certain level of, that we would spend. So we're in year one of the three year contract with Christus. And it goes up 5% next year. Right. So I have in the budget for next year about a $450,000 increase in what we will probably have to put in the plan. We already put about two to two and a half million every year aside from the premiums we pay. I budget a two to two and a half million that I place in there to help cover um, claims. But next year it'll have to go up a little bit more. And just a refresher for the public, we are self-insured. Yes. Uh, we're self-funded, excuse me. We are self-funded as far as insurance goes and that compared to other school systems that are on the state's plan is significant. If you participate with our health insurance here in Tyler ISD, it's, it's quite significant as far as what your take home is at the end of the month or at the end of the year. Right, and we'll be bringing that to you all at the August workshop. Yeah, we'll have a comparison of what, if you participate with our health care, um, along with the raises that we're going to propose to you all next month, what that looks like versus some of our peers. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'll find if if you participate in our health care, um, your spouse, along with your children, um, you do that in another school system that's on the state plan, it's going to be a significant number, and we'll give that to you at the workshop. It's a pretty good perk that's kind of hard to explain at times, Tyler ISD teachers, but at the same time, uh, 
a lot of districts are giving their raises to be able to cover um, the increase in health care uh, premiums from the state plan from uh, active care, whereas we're going to be able to protect our raises significantly. Okay, exciting news. We have uh, item C, student code of conduct for 2019-2020 school year. And in your packet, you have your first reading. Um, if you have any questions as you're going through that, feel free to call Mr. Sanchez, Assistant Superintendent of Schools, um, or John Johnson, who is coordinator of our constituent services. They put teams together to put these student code of conduct um, opportunities together and put them in the in there for y'all to read we did get the spanish version i saw that today from tasb so that'll also be included is that included in there right now the spanish version i can't remember if it got included so. or not. it's not so it'll be the spanish version of what you've got in front of you but yeah okay. but i have one question i don't know if it's to you or if it's to Riley, mr sanchez dr sanchez Districts shall not use out-of-school suspension for students below third grade or uh, homeless, I understand. So if a student fails to exhibit self-control, mm -hmm. kindergarten, first, second, we're saying that that student cannot be suspended from school? Out of school. So you have in school. That's state law. So if I, I, <laughs> if I call a parent to come pick up, Junior, because Junior is having a real rough day and is being a little violent. Yo, are you considering that out of school suspension? No, if you went through a formal disciplinary uh, hearing for out of school suspension, yes. If you call the parent and the parent wants to work with Principal Mason, let me just come get Junior because he's not acting well and I'm tired of you calling me. We didn't suspend that kid. The parent agreed to come and take him home. I just want to be sure teachers have options. I believe in supporting teachers, and we can't allow students to disrupt our classrooms when other children are there to learn. Our philosophy is one child will not disrupt the learning opportunities of 21 others, and that is to be conveyed to our principals again this year, and we'll main, that will be maintained throughout my administration. All right. And we'll take care of those kiddos, too. They need to go through some type of restorative opportunities there but as far as uh, removing them from the classroom uh, we're not going to allow disruptions to occur in our in our classrooms All right. but in school suspension is the strategy on that to remove the child from the classroom not out of school at grades K through 2 per state law can I ask a question if they get into in school suspension and the behavior continues then what happens other strategies as a sign. Okay. I just want to be clear. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's there's a, a list of things that can happen on there. You, you're familiar with that, Mr. Sterling, as a principal. But um, suspension of younger children is a leg legislative action that, that happened this last session, not this session. And so there's other opportunities as far as parent engagement, parent shadowing parent meetings and usually the kiddos hopefully respond if their parents get engaged okay any other questions or comments about the uh, student code of conduct first reading if not we'll move on to the report on cooperative purchasing fees So this is a new law from the legislative session that's just finished, the 86th. And you have a report in your packet on cooperative purchasing fees. From In future years, we're probably just going to put that in the, in the uh, consent agenda. But as co -op, purchasing co-ops um, throughout the state are utilized by school systems. They're actually state approved, but they want to know what the, uh, they want your local um, constituents to know what the fees associated with those purchasing co-ops look like and they're on page 148 of your packet any questions about that region 7 Harris County co-op you've heard of buy board there's a lot of purchasing co-ops out there that, that allow us to keep the cost down in regard to uh, uh, you know spending 
for, for resources, everything from AstroTurf to, 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 to classroom furniture. Um, and I, I appreciate the state having that in there, but at the same time, there are also fees that are associated with that. Those are in the back. We'll, this is the first time we've ever done this, so we include it in discussion. Next year, we'll just put it in consent agenda for your information. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to item E, a pre-K Head Start update. Yeah. So we had this on here as a kind of a placeholder for discussion for the board can actually talk to me about some questions. But we're excited about the direction that we're going. Um, I, I don't know what was conveyed elsewhere out there on social media or, or, or within other um, opportunities for communication, but um, we had to make a change instructionally. And regardless of what um, the, the Head Start Act says, the uh, it had gotten twisted, it had gotten confused as far as instruction goes. It had gotten flipped um, to where the district was um, was was second to the to the Head Start initiative. I'm not saying the Head Start's a bad initiative. I think that they've got, it's got great resources embedded inside of it, but it did not need to drive the instructional program of our school system. Um, so in saying that, after conversations with the national director of Head Start, um, Dr. Deborah Bergeron, um, that that instructional influence is something that she agreed with. That, however, that got conveyed to our school system, um, whether through the regional office or just it was perceived here locally, was 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 flat out wrong. And that that uh, that we had every right to design the instructional program, uh, calibrate that to our standards, uh, to the, the which are calibrated to the state standards at the same time. Um, Head Start is an approved program by the state of Texas. But as we shift towards pre-K um, and we look for instructional equity to go across the, uh, across the spectrum of economically disadvantaged, we think that, that every kid deserves the good stuff instructionally. Um, we also believe that the kids that come from an economically disadvantaged background also deserve additional supports. Much what's the Head Start uh, was designed to do and when we did consider moving in an alternative direction because of the pre-k funding uh, we were going to try to mirror a lot of those different types of opportunities there so we're excited about it um, we're going to continue to have the head start program in Tyler ISD um, upon further inspection of some of the things as we drilled down deep into to, to uh, what we needed to do what we needed to improve where we need to tweak it um, as far as how we structured uh, personnel that is a district function, according to Head Start, uh, from the, the national director. They're under contract with Tyler ISD. And the way we design that, as long as it is allowable with inside the grant, um, that, that's fine with them. They've given us the opportunity to do that. I think we have some things in, in writing from the regional office that says that we can design some things a certain way. So in saying that, um, I really am appreciative of, of the conversation that we've had locally in the community. Um, this board right here does a good job of, of making sure that they follow the Texas Open Meetings Act and do not discuss things amongst themselves or operate as a board between meetings because they can't. I think here in Smith County, everybody knows that that's a no-no. So in saying that, they, individual board members may have had conversations with me in regard to seeing if we could find a different way a different path to win that is win-win and I think tonight that we can uh, we can confidently say that we do have that 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 on the horizon and I do apologize that that we don't have that present to you tonight but at the same time it should be pretty pretty quickly and I do realize that, that we have a month left of school until school starts and we'll be getting something out to the public um, as soon as we possibly can what questions do you have what would you all like to talk about so we can assure Mr. Sales that uh, we will continue the work of the Policy Council, which Mr. Sales, I have had the privilege of serving on. So board members do serve on the Policy Council. Um, and we will, um, I know in some form, still have our wraparound services. Absolutely. You said as that part before. Of that, as part of that recalibration upon further inspection, yes, the district will be involved with that Policy Council. We do have a vacancy with the directorship, 
Um, whether or not we find someone before that will be up to human resources, um, along with Mr. Sanchez. Uh, if we need to go to the interim director route, we've got some opportunities and some options that are out there right now to get us through that. And oh, by the way, applying for next year's grant or a notice of intent is right around the corner. And uh, we fully intend to do that. So um, whatever perceptions there were about that had more to do with um, the rollout of pre-K and what we felt we were restricted to do, and um, it was a it was a it was an intervention from from the very top of the Head, head Start org chart that really played a part in being allow, allowing us to do that. Um, as far as wraparound services with the with the medical and the and the the, the dental, mm -hmm. um, those are still going to be in place, and we we do have past contracts with vendors that are here local. We'll continue to use those that 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 are benefit that benefit our our students and in, in, in support of their parents as well. Um, as far as personnel structuring of of how we how we do that, that'll be something that'll be um, structured. We're currently in that as well. We're looking actually to to start bringing on some uh, more social workers uh, that are that are actually four year degreed. Uh, we actually have some that are already in house. One that's currently working on something. And then we, I think we have one vacancy um, right now as far as trying to find that as well. So um, we're looking at that. Another thing that we're, we're wanting to talk about, and please interrupt me whenever y'all want to. I don't, they'll just leave the microphone on the table. I don't care. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, family and student support teams at every campus are going to be designed. I'll go uh, ahead and jump in, Dr. Crawford. If you want to take it from there, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, thank you. Yeah, okay. So we've, we've been meeting over the last several weeks on, even before a decision was made, we, we committed to, to the students of Tyler ISD, regardless of whether they had a Head Start label on them or a pre-K label on them, because we're committed to students. And so as we begin to look at the models of Head Start and what we could realistically do, um, we had already begun to formulate some, a plan or an organization chart, if you will, on what that would look like. And so in conjunction with health services, the counseling department, constituent services, building principals, master teachers, um, then we have a, an opportunity to, to take care of the whole child. And with, this, with the agreements and the collaboration that we already have with some of our health services, with some of our counseling departments, it's gonna be a really, really seamless transition between um, pre-K and Head Start because at the end of the day, it's a pre-K kid, whether they have a Head Start label, and what's gonna be really nice, it's gonna be a pre-K, it's gonna be pre-K, and then we're gonna wrap around the Head Start, head start services around all pre-K kids. And so it's just not gonna, uh, the Head Start kids are not the only ones that are gonna benefit, but all kids will benefit, because there'll be health screening available for all kids, we'll do the dental uh, availability for all kids, we'll have the, um, blood, they check their blood, check their weight, check their height, all kids will, will be available for that. We've also asked the case managers and the social workers to come in and begin to, to call parents, to talk to parents, and to make sure that we set, those, set up those one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. And so I'm using terms that people who are in Head Start are familiar with so that we can give them a level of assurance that we have, we're checking off the things that we are required to do. And I wanna make sure that we're real, real clear about there's a thing called compliant and commitment. And we're not gonna just rely on compliance, we're gonna be committed. We're gonna be committed to taking care of pre-kids and pre-K kids and taking care of the whole child. And so as not just the kid, but as the kid goes into the classroom to ensure that the teacher is teaching at a level and a rigor that kids can be school ready and that the principals have an assurance that there's gonna be some professional development lined up with that. There's going to be some ongoing professional development with uh, with teachers, and we always talk about social relevance. Relevance. I said it right. Relevance. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and making sure that our teachers understand where kids are coming from, and what their social economic status is, and what their background, and where kids are coming from, and parents are having to deal with when they leave the when kids are what kids are having to deal with as they leave the home. And it's just not, and we, we have a tendency to think that just low SES kids have issues that, as they walk out the door. All kids are having issues. 
we're in a different time. It, there, it just looks different. And so we wanna make sure that all teachers are cult culturally understanding of that. Not just from a low, low SES standpoint, but I think it's from an emotional standpoint because we're having to work with our universities as well to, to take a look at maybe if they have some opportunities for some intervention from the collegiate level that they can help with. So it's a total wraparound service that we're really gonna embark upon. And we have some dates available that they're gonna be able to come and interview, do the interviews and do all the tests that they need before the start of school and to assure that, that the community knows it's gonna be easily two weeks that will all be completed before school even starts and the notifications. You'll have plenty of time uh, before school starts for all that to happen. So parents should know within two weeks where their child will be going to school. Absolutely. So the, I appreciate Raleigh's passion on all kids, but understand the kids that qualify for Head Start, their specificity and what they're allowed for and what their parents are going to receive will be exclusive to Head Start. With the FAST, the, the family and student support teams uh, in regard to that, that's where the campus will also support some of those qualifying pre kers mm -hmm. as well, correct? That's correct. Also, and so what, what the charge of Head Start is, is to empower parents and in, to engage them in the local community resources available. And so that's what we're gonna make sure happens. We're gonna ensure that parents are engaged with community resources available to impact their lives and the lives of their children. So that might look a little different than what we have been accustomed to seeing. But our job is to ensure that kids are school ready. And then we provide parents the means and the resources to those community services. And so we're gonna make sure that happens. So now that you've laid that in front of Dr. Hansen with curriculum, let's talk about curriculum real quick. Okay, so um, the district does use the DLM and um, have you, we've used that with quite a bit of success with our, um, our pre-K kids, the tuition-based kids and our half-day pre-K kids, bilingual and English. So we, are, we do also have curriculum teams that enhance that. So we have some enhancements because there are, with any written curriculum, there are some gaps and some weaknesses and we realize that. So our ex teacher experts, along with the curriculum team, write some enhancements in order to improve some, some pieces of it. And every pre-K teacher will use the, the district curriculum this year, which is the basis of it is the DLM Express. Because I think the perception was in the past was that just the district's required PD for, for a normal teacher was supplemental to anything Head Start, which it should be the other way around. Is that correct? That's, that, that's exactly what I that, heard. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From Dr. Bergeron right. was that, that the district standard because they're under contract with Tyler ISD as a teacher. The professional development requirements are the basic requirements there. They would get supplemental stuff of Head Start yeah. above that. Right. Correct. It's not the other way around, right. which is right. the way we were kind of operating um, quite a bit. So, mm -hmm. and let me, let me speak of one other thing. I know there's been a lot of talk about that. There's the, the, the performance and the data that's just being used there mm -hmm. of the, the kiddos that are in part of those programs that there's tuition. But how much, what's the percentage of the tuition kids that make up the total pre-K population? So um, last year, the total pre-K population was less than 30% of the total number of kids that were tested in pre-K. 65% um, of the kids that we're, that we're looking at with that pre-K number were half-day kids. They, they didn't go to school full day. They were half day bilingual or half day pre K kids. Okay. And, 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 and they were low socioeconomic students. Right. Good curriculum is good curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it's always been my understanding and my experience in, in, dis in urban districts that are extremely impoverished that all kids deserve a shot at the, at, at the good curriculum. Right. And I think and that's what we're going for here. Is that correct? Yes. And the most okay. and, and the good curriculum, and as I spoke about earlier, related to the foundational skills and the great PD. So we're investing a lot of resources in, you know, great, high quality professional development. And we want to make sure that every pre-K teacher 
um, regardless of what fund they are paid for out of, is go that they are experiencing that great professional learning opportunity because that then translates into great instructional strategies in the classroom. Good. Okay, you got personnel sitting next to you. I don't know if he wants to participate in this board meeting or not, but Chief of Staff Ron Jones. Everybody, y'all know, y'all remember Mr. Jones over there. Um, one thing I will say in regard to, I think there was a question about what the classes look like this year. We did consider the blending of those classrooms. Is that correct? Where we had pre-K and Head Start kids all together and tuition kids all together. But I guess Tasha, that, that's something we cannot do because of the grant this year. Is that correct? Sorry, Ron, you'll get to talk here in a minute. Okay. We have applied for the grant and we have to have 432 children or no, at least 97% of that. And so for our space, the amount of space we have at each campus, we're gonna have the 22 classrooms, which is 432, and then we have um, 12 additional pre-K. Now, on some campuses, we'll have Head Start and qualifying and tuition. At one campus, we have all three. Yeah. And so ja we can Jack Elementary is going to have, all, have three. all three. Jack has a Head Start, and so they can, you know, work on. And we have what. Bell is going to have both, Clarkston, um, let's see, Jones. They'll have both tuition, well, qualifying and Head Start. And then um, some of them have tuition too. So we'll be able to try to mix some in those schools. Yeah. But the other ones will be exclusive yeah, exactly right and so next year as we apply for the grant that is one thing one thing that we're probably going to look at doing and, and even the regional head start office said that that would be something that would that, that they've seen done in quite a bit of places in fact dr bergeron did give us an example out of i won't say it's too loud connecticut that that's where they do that at and and so that's something we that we really think that will ensure that equity of instruction in there um, that, that's, that's been working at other school systems. You did a site visit today, Raleigh? Yeah, so Rojo, do you want, or Mr. Jones, excuse me, <laughs> would you like to um, speak in regard to personnel at all? Of course, let okay. me uh, speak to um, our vacancies that we uh, currently have uh, with the uh, director of Head Start. We have a robust uh, list of candidates that we have to vet, uh, but we are certainly not going to be in a rush uh, to choose that individual, we have a game plan should there be a need for an interim uh, to run in this school year. So we are looking for quality uh, and we are gonna make sure uh, that we achieve that. And as far as uh, the um, employees that were um, employed last year at Head Start, uh, we have been working with them to find uh, positions for them. Uh, I think everyone with the exception of maybe one to this point and they will be taken care of. And some have opted to uh, pursue other avenues uh, but we have uh, touch bases with all of those individuals that have been impacted and I think uh, many of them have been uh, very pleased with what uh, their opportunities have come out to be. Uh, as far as the case managers and uh, social workers go, we are uh, in the process right now of trying to uh, determine the exact number that we are going to enter in this, uh, into the school year with. Uh, so we will be meeting here uh, tomorrow uh, to finalize uh, personnel uh, concerns with uh, Head Start as we move forward. So we are primed and we will be ready uh, to go here in just uh, in just a little bit. So there are restrictions within the grant board, um, one of having a director for Head Start, but then there's other flexibilities on how you structure your wraparound service support as well. And I think that's where we've been give, provided some flexibility from the regional office, is that correct? Okay, again, some other inspections that we've had since we've gone, since we've uh, spent this last month of, of of, um, of looking at all things Head Start, Pre-K. Um, we're gonna spend our money differently as well. Uh, I'll just make that commitment here as well in regard to the Head Start grant. There's some opportunities there as far as the curriculum goes, as far as professional development goes, that we're gonna be able to provide some, some high quality opportunities for the teaching and learning aspect of it. And as we wrap up our little part of the presentation, you know, maybe I wanna ask some more questions or not. Um, that's really what we entered into this for. And that was the, the instructional influence to, to align that because we, if you've got 432 kids, round that up to, to 500 kids, 
um, that are entering into your 1500 student kindergarten cohort that um, maybe we're, we're struggling to get the, uh, the, the Tyler ISD curriculum at no fault of the teacher, at no fault of anyone else until we were empowered to do so by Dr. Bergeron. Um, it was something that we really wanted to, to investigate. We thought that um, with, with the state providing um, additional dollars uh, for consideration, it was something that we were going to be able to venture on. And I know that there's been numbers thrown out there in regard to the amount of, uh, of dollars that we've received from the grant. Tasha, why don't you speak on that? The, the grant was for $3.2 million, is that correct? I think that's, it's, a, it's $3 million or yeah. something. I don't have the exact amount. But because of some of the district match that we were having to, to apply towards that, because of the, some of the requirements we of the grant. We a certain percentage of what the spend is. Right. And so we, we were barely. Barely touching that, that, is that correct? Well, if, we're, if we were getting, getting there. It, but barely. Barely, so. yeah. So in saying that, it, it wasn't like we were considering just giving up all that money. We, there, was a, there was a delta in there between the pre-K money that was coming from the state versus what we were already getting on Head Start that we felt we were comfortable that we could provide some efficiencies to support the, the folks with the wraparound services and whatnot. But that's just being transparent and coming out in public and saying the things that, that, that was on our mind at that time, um, here we are. And in saying that, we're not there anymore. We're, again, we're going to be pretty involved with this uh, pre-K initiative with early ed and whatever that looks like, whether it be the, uh, the qualifiers in pre-K or the Head Start kiddos, along with the policy council and their parents, um, along with the tuition kids. We're going to be pretty involved in it, uh, and, and our ultimate goal is successful student outcomes. Um, because that is our responsibility. Our responsibility is on the academic side of this, of, of this. And all parents are aware that we're not having half day pre-K, that it is all full day pre-K. Well, I don't know how they can't not know. Well, there's but well, apparently so many misunderstandings about different aspects yeah. of this. And, and, and again, uh, idea, you, you can't discriminate against a, a, a kid uh, of disabilities. Dr. Hanson, you want to care, you care to talk about that? Maybe we need to change so, our application. Well, we, we did take that statement off. Um, the, the statement was about the fact that you cannot qualify for special ed through that program. So when students qualify for special education, they have to go through the special education process. Um, there's a whole referral and, and assessment process that has to occur any student can be in any program in, in our district. We, we don't discriminate based on disabilities. Um, but the, the intent of the statement was to help parents understand that it's not a PPCD program, it's not a special education program that students automatically go into, um, so that there is a process. And so sure. it, so that's it's, so what that if, was about. if there is a, a, a parent that might have a child that they suspect has some, uh, a disability what, what should they do, Doc? So they, they can contact their school or they can contact the Office of Academic Intervention. And we did, in fact, have students with disabilities in the tuition-based program and in Head Start and in our regular pre-K program. So we had students with disabilities in, in, all, in, in all of our pre-K programs as we do all of our classes. Um, so they can contact the academic intervention, they can contact their local school to get um, that process, talk about that process, so there are some opportunities there. Dr. Crawford and uh, Dr. Hanson, let's make sure that this type of information is available on our website as well as on channel 19. All this information so parents will have it. Right. I, I know that communications, Jessica, has been working on the website to make sure that it's updated and then we have everything updated. We will we'll check that again. Channel 19 yes, as well. Yes, ma'am. Before y'all go on to this next very important item, unless you you still have more questions, just real clearly, Mr. Sanchez, the principals run our campuses, the Head Start classrooms, the pre-K classrooms. That is it's like if we had a growth spurt other than just providing, making sure that they have a safe place to go to school every day and that they're going to the lunchroom, instructionally speaking, the accountability rests upon whom? Rests on the principal. Okay. So teachers will have an opportunity to teach. 
principals will have an opportunity to evaluate the teaching in the classroom. Constituent services, health services, counseling, uh, the family engagement specialists, the caseworkers, the social workers will take care of the compliance part of Head Start. Teachers have an opportunity to teach without interruption. Principals will have an opportunity to evaluate the rigor of the instruction without interruption. And all of us will take care and support what happens in the classroom. And are we still on track for another five to 600 pre-K students on top of the Head Start? So we said roughly 1,000, I think, at the last but board we'd meeting. Like to to we'd like to get to 1,000 pre-K How are we doing eventually. on that? Yeah, I think we fully understood we weren't going to get to 1,000 this year, but we'd like to grow to that. And knowing that our kindergarten co cohorts are usually 1,500 kids per we realize there's other private pre-Ks and whatnot. So this year's initial, we were hoping anywhere 600, I think, is what I we I think what 600 we because we'll have um, 22 head starts and 12 um, pre-K. Pre-K. So it'll be around 600. And then hopefully next year we can add. Yeah. 18 to 20 kids per pre-K classroom. You can have 20 in head start. Right. You can have 22 in our our regular pre-k and head start has a teacher and an aide exactly our pre-k's have a teacher and an a aide. teacher and an aide the requirement for full day pre-k is you have to have one to every 11 so okay thank you any other further comments or questions about head start i'll say that um once again i just I just see where we're heading in a, a better direction with instruction, facilities, and, and more kids served. Um, I know that when change occurs, sudden change especially, there's some fear, and I understand that, but I want the public to know we are prepared and we care for every single kid in this district. Um, we are 70 plus percent low socioeconomic. We care about every single kid. and. And you don't serve on this board and not, you don't be on the school board and not care about every single kid, including the ones that are the most poor. Um, in 2013, I came on the board, there was a bond. There was pushback from that, there was some change. We, had, uh, we hired a new superintendent. He reorganized the whole staff. There was change there. We got emails, calls about that. There was change. Uh, then uh, the desegregation order. There was a lot of pushback on that. Um, then we changed attendance zones. And, um, but looking back, we went from 11 schools on RR uh, to zero. And we went from a C to what's looking like a B. And so, um, Dr. Crawford, I believe in, in your staff and I believe in you and I believe that we will be able to make this better. And I think in three to four years, uh, we'll be able to look back and see that this had a major impact on uh, positive impact on our goals and our uh, scores and uh, back there on the wall we like you said it earlier we focus on successful student outcomes and not as much on adult incomes and um, you know we are all about the kids and I think this will have a very very positive impact on what we do so I, I agree um, other challenges uh, there was a pretty significant bond election that was in there as well at the back end on the yeah. 17 that's pretty yeah. good one but in saying that i do think that that uh change is tough and um doing things the way you've done them always just because that's the way it, that, that you've done them is, is pretty dangerous and uh again i apologize if i if we didn't convey that uh the, our, our goal was on the academic end of this and um now that we've been given some time to sort that out here we are and we're gonna again i think we're gonna be involved to the extent that you want us involved um, as far as the pre-k goes because again it goes back to the principal of the campus we're not going to have any ambigu ambiguity in regard to the academic outcomes of our students if they go to tyler isd schools and there were there was a lot of ambiguity in regard to that um, to no fault of anybody it was just kind of something that it was a culture that had evolved that, that uh, we needed some assurances from a from a 
from the very top that we could overcome, and, and I'm glad we're here now talking about it and, and able to go forward now. Okay. Thank you. So we have one more discussion item, which is House Bill 3 and the budget impact thereof. Yeah, well, this is a uh, – I think we have a PowerPoint for you. Okay. This is a review of a previous um, – presentation that we provided I think it was two months ago or it was last month I've been having so much fun up here just move, move so fast um, and so there's a little review there in regard to that I do think we're at a point now to where we can convey to the board that we're probably going to be coming back and um, providing option four uh, for the board's consideration uh, this next uh, uh, this act actually at the August workshop, I believe, is something we're going to get y'all to approve on that. So please consider it. Um, in saying that, it is well above what the the statute required for us to uh, um, to provide for our staff. Um, there's option four right there. You want to talk about that, Tasha? Okay, teach teachers, nurses, and counselors one to five years will do the 2500 you have to provide a differentiation for teachers from six to 20 years and so we're going to pop up to 4,000 on that and teachers greater than 23,000 this act that um, state minimum salary scale actually stops at 20 and they said to dif differentiate between six and 20 years so and then the Second part of the equation were the clerical and manual trades. Um, we did a 6%, and then the other areas are 4 And if we go to the next slide, our gain in revenue is around 8.6. It could be more. I don't have the final tax numbers yet. I'm expecting to get them at the end of the week. But of that gain, we're required to give 30% to teachers, counselors, and nurses, and clerical technical. So 30% of the gain was around 2.6 million. The teacher portion of that is 1.8 million, and um, the clerical manual trades is around 800,000. And if you look back at option four, we've clearly exceeded that on all levels. We've more than doubled it on teachers from what we were required to do. So percentage wise, we were debating today, did you ever get a firm number? It was around six. It's around six percent? Mm -hmm. Five to six. I mean, there's been people floating some 10, some nine, some eights, but six I think is, is pretty good bump considering what was provided to us, what was mandated it's by us to do mm -hmm. that. Now, as we look into the future, one thing that we did talk about today, I challenge that staff over there, or at least two of them. Um, next year, there's a, there's another bump coming up, and we've got some needs that we're gonna have, certainly pre-K to be one of them, but there'd also be some other opportunities there. Plus, we're also gonna look organizationally, internally, in regard to being able to lean up a little bit. Um, I'm, I don't know if we can get there or not, but starting teacher pay at 50K, it, it's a bold, vision for us. Um, Abilene's getting close and we just, we just, we need to compete better. And we may not get to right at 50, but that is something I think that will give us an advantage when you pair that with our um, healthcare. And because uh, we need to compete for good teachers. So we will bring, be bringing that to you. Whether or not that's in the form of straight salary or through outcomes based um, incentives and salary will be something that we'll, we'll uh, talk about with you over the next coming year. Right, because we'll have the grant that we can apply for for merit. Right, there's there's also some dollars Straight. that are coming out of TEA for, wow. for performance and outcome based stuff. So uh, we're, we're pretty serious about this, but this is a pretty good start. And I appreciate our, our local legislators and advocating for our um, for our teachers here in Smith County, specifically Tyler ISD, Brian Hughes and Matt Schaefer deserve um, their names to be mentioned out loud and their support of our of our adventures this last session this last spring because they they spent a lot of time in public ed 
and I'm glad they did it because there won't be any time spent the next time in public ed in the next legislative session. None. This looks great. Let me see if they can do something about retired teachers. Hey, you're getting the 13th check this year. Congratulations. <laughs> I don't know what that looks like, Mr. Sterling. I don't well, know. haven't seen it yet. <laughs> don't talk to my mama about it. She, but she's appreciative, but at the same time, it's it's been tough um, as far as taking care of the retirees, and, and, and I hope that there's some plans in the future to be able to do that. But right now, y'all don't need to put your hands up in the air, but maybe some head nods, some eyebrows, eyes. We're going to bring this back to y'all. If you've got any um, questions or if you have any concerns or comments or ideas, feel free to contact myself or Ms. Bjork or Mr. Jones over there in regard to the uh, uh, increases that we will be bringing back to y'all for proposed uh, action at I the workshop. I appreciate the fact you included everybody. Yeah. I mean, it takes everybody to, uh, to get the kids to school, to feed the kids, yes, to does. make sure the facilities have that are clean or safe. Um, absolutely. And I think, I think some of the demagoguery that's out there include those in administrative expenditures as if all those dollars are located at the soup's office or in the CFO's office or with the chief of staff, but no. But we know that they're not. Administration so. <laughs> and management of the school system so that kids can have successful opportunities. Um, it takes everybody to do that. And we're very appreciative that we've got a good staff here. Do we think um, health premium, the employee contribution piece is gonna stay fairly constant? We will be raising the premium 5%. Um, we did not raise it last year, and we really have to just to keep up. And I think that only, if I look, if I'm remembering correctly, raises our amount from employees like 350000 So it helps a little bit, but so it's if I, not significant. So of this 2500 raise, roughly how much is going to be effective after? Well, it depends on which plan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What plan and, 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 how, and how... how how deep you are in the participation because mm. there's, right. there's a different and cost. And if you're doing employee yeah. spouse is more expensive okay. than employee child and we, it just varies. We'll well, you'll a, see the chart. Yeah, we'll give you the chart at the workshop in August and we wouldn't spend all that time talking about it here earlier if we didn't think we have a big advantage on it, mm -hmm. even if we're going to have to go up a little bit on premiums. Okay. Any further comments or questions? regarding that item okay on to future business can y'all believe school is cool starts or is here and it's august 1st, august 1st. it's just right around the corner mm -hmm. is, that a, is that week after next mm -hmm. board workshop on august 6th summer school graduation at ctc is that right mr sanchez okay august 9th next week um yeah. not as many summer grads this year i love promoting some of the good things that are going on our school system Rise Academy graduated 91 kids this year. Those are usually the kiddos that would have been eligible for summer grad if they'd have got there. So kudos to Rise Academy for being able to get those kids across the stage. But we do have some summer school graduates and they deserve a graduation and a high five from, from y'all. Uh, first day of school for students. I can't believe we're talking about that. We're inside of a month on that. It's August 19th. And then the regular meeting. We're gonna have a nice long day that day. We're gonna be visiting campuses and then we'll culminate that day with a with an August board meeting that night that's all I've got okay well thank you I will take a motion for adjournment I move so we move. adjourn second second okay all in favor say aye aye, aye. all aye. opposed the meeting is adjourned